Technically, the term heat pump refers to a device that moves heat by doing work, so that is by using energy. So essentially, it's a machine that removes heat from one place and then dumps it somewhere else. Heat pumps have actually been around for a very long time uh, and you've probably known them as refrigerators and air conditioning systems because those are types of heat pumps. A refrigerator is a heat pump that removes heat from the food that you store inside it and then dumps that heat in your kitchen. An air conditioning unit is a scaled up version of this, of course, that removes heat from the inside of a building and then dumps it outside so that the temperature inside the building becomes lower during a hot day. More recently, people have also started using heat pumps for heating applications. So in that case, you're using a heat pump that takes heat from outside and then puts it into the building with the goal of making it warmer inside. Now, the interesting thing about a heat pump is that it moves heat against the direction of natural heat transfer. So a refrigerator moves heat from its inside into your kitchen, into, your, into the environment, even though the refrigerator is very cold inside and the kitchen is warm, and normally heat would flow from hot to cold. But the heat pump is capable of moving heat from the cold area, which is the inside of the fridge, into your kitchen, which is against the natural direction of heat transfer. Same thing goes for a heat pump that is used for a heating system. Inside a building, it might be 20 degrees Celsius, whereas outside the building, it might only be 10 degrees. And yet, the heat pump is capable of taking heat from the outside air, or the outside ground in some cases, uh, and move that heat into the building to make it warmer inside, which is, again, against the natural direction of heat transfer. But now, of course, we want to know how does a heat pump actually do this? How does it manage to move heat uh, in the opposite direction, essentially? Well, there are actually loads of ways of doing it. There are loads of different methods that you can use to move heat around like this. Uh, but the most popular way of doing it is called the vapor compression cycle. This is the principle that almost all heat pumps use. So refrigerators use it, freezers use it, air conditioning systems use it, uh, and also the new ones that are used for heating applications, they use it as well. And again, there are other methods, but this is by far the most popular system. So let's just take a look at a schematic drawing that I made of a vapor compression system. As you can see, it's a closed loop that consists of five main parts. First of all, there is the compressor, then we've got something called the condenser, followed by a storage tank, after which we've got an expander or an expansion device, also known as a throttling valve, and finally there is the evaporator. This loop is filled with a special substance that we call a refrigerant. What kind of refrigerant is used depends on the desired specifications of a system, uh, and the conditions that it's used in. So for example, you can imagine that a freezer uses a different kind of refrigerant than a normal refrigerator or an air conditioning unit uh, because it operates at different temperatures. For now, the only thing that is important to remember is that the refrigerant is some kind of substance that is suitable for this vapor compression cycle system. The condenser, and therefore also the storage tank, is connected to the output of the compressor and therefore the pressure in this part of the system is relatively high. The evaporator on the other hand is connected to the inlet of the compressor and therefore the pressure in this part of the system is relatively low. And the pressure difference is maintained because the expander or the throttling valve is essentially a very thin tube through which the refrigerant has to flow and because it's so narrow we're able to maintain this pressure difference. Okay, so now let's just walk through the entire system uh, and see what happens to the refrigerant as it goes along, starting inside the storage tank. When the refrigerant is inside the storage tank, it is in its liquid form and its temperature is around room temperature, so it's about 20 degrees Celsius, for example. It's relatively warm. 
the liquid refrigerant first goes through the expander and then enters the evaporator. Now, as we discussed, inside the evaporator, the pressure is very low. And because of the low pressure, that means the boiling point of our refrigerant inside this evaporator is much lower than it used to be. Therefore, the relatively warm liquid refrigerant immediately boils and starts to evaporate. But of course, evaporation is a very endothermic process. It's a process that needs a lot of energy in order to take place. This effect can be observed when you're boiling some water. Simply bringing the water up to its boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius goes relatively quickly, but then actually boiling off all of that water, evaporating it entirely, takes way longer to happen because it needs way more energy than simply heating up the water. And this also happens in our refrigerant. The evaporation process needs a lot of energy to take place. And that energy has to come from somewhere. And it's going to come from the thermal energy or the heat that was already stored in the refrigerant. This means that as our refrigerant enters the evaporator, its temperature immediately drops way down to the new boiling point. And so now we've got a mixture of liquid and gases refrigerant that is very cold inside our evaporator. And this mixture will then flow through the rest of the evaporator. And as this happens, the remaining liquid refrigerant also evaporates. And that during this process, the temperature inside the evaporator remains constant at the boiling point. This means that this part of the system, this evaporator, is very cold. So this is the cold side of the heat pump or the, the input of the heat pump. The now gaseous refrigerant then flows into the compressor. The compressor compresses the refrigerant and then sends it into the condenser. But as we discussed, inside the condenser, the pressure is much higher because this is the high pressure side of the system. And now exactly the opposite happens. Due to the high pressure applied to the gases refrigerant, its temperature rises. So now we have a temperature increase rather than a temperature decrease. So this side of the system gets very hot. Now then the refrigerant starts losing that heat into its environment. And as it does so, it condenses back into its liquid form. And that way it goes through the entire condenser. And when it reaches the storage tank, it is now roughly at room temperature again, and the cycle repeats. And so this side, the condenser, is the hot side of the system where we're losing heat into the environment. So this is the output of the heat pump. So this is what the vapor compression cycle does. This is what's going on in most refrigerators, air conditioning units, and also these new systems that are used for heating purposes. But now I'd like to zoom in on a very interesting question, and that is, why would you use a heat pump for a heating application? Because we've traditionally, we've been using heat pumps all the time for cooling systems, for air conditioning units, for refrigerators, freezers, etc. But we haven't been really using them that much for uh, heating applications. And that is because if I want to heat a building, I might as well use an electric heater or a, a gas powered heater or even a wood stove because those systems are much cheaper and much simpler than a heat pump right because a heat pump is a rather complicated and expensive device it requires maintenance uh, and for cooling we basically have no other option so okay we are forced to use it but for heating why would you why would you use one okay because it's just too complicated too expensive you might as well install an electric heater but recently, they've gained popularity, uh, and that has to do with something called coefficient of performance. Now, that sounds complicated, but uh, compared to what we just discussed, it's not very complicated at all. Let's say we have an electric heater that we're using to heat a building, okay? And that electric heater has an efficiency of 100%. It's a good heater. So this means that if we put in one kilowatt hour of electricity, into this heater, it'll produce for us one kilowatt hour of heat. This means its coefficient of performance is equal to one, because for every kilowatt hour of electricity that you put into it, you also get one kilowatt hour of usable heat in your building, which is, you know, pretty good. 
But here's the thing. A heat pump uses a different strategy. So the electric heater takes electricity that you put into it and uses that to create new heat. Okay? It converts electrical energy into thermal energy. A heat pump, on the other hand, takes heat that already exists and then moves that heat into the building. Okay, that's what it uses the energy for. It doesn't use the energy to make new heat. It uses the energy to move heat that already exists. And it does also produce a small amount of heat itself, of course, because the compressor is not 100% efficient. But what this means is that it's capable of moving amounts of heat that are actually greater than the amount of energy that it needs to do that. So it's possible to have a heat pump that moves two or three kilowatt hours of heat using just one kilowatt hour of electricity okay and air conditioning units and refrigerators have been doing this for years but people have started to realize wait a minute if we start using this for a heating system it means that we can heat the same building using half or even a third the amount of electricity that we would normally need to do it which is of course very good for their wallet uh, and for the environment. This is why heat pumps are becoming more popular now uh, to use as heating systems. But of course they still are expensive machines, they still are complicated, they require maintenance, which is why traditional heating solutions still remain quite popular as well. So there you go, now you know what a heat pump is, what it does and how it works, and also why we use it. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this video. And of course, thank you for watching.